fucking welcome to FCU Pod, especially heinous. I'm fucking Gabe. I am Tasha Gersh. What? I don't know. I don't know. We hate it here. <laughs> we are on season five, episode 16, Home. So the opening scene, it's the morning and a woman is talking to her husband while he's reading the paper and she's telling him about her week and the plans that they have. And he's just being like, mm -hmm, you know, like obviously not paying attention. And then she's like, and also I'm going to run off to Belize with the paper boy. And then he's like, um, wait, what the hell was that? And she's like, ah, it's a miracle you can hear. It was like, look at this cute New York couple. And then the whole studio audience was like, ha <laughs> <laughs> Men don't like their wives. They don't listen. <laughs> he right. hates her marriage <laughs> they hear some clattering outside and he's like oh fucking damn homeless making a mess every time they throw shit around i get fined he's all pissed and he grabs a fire poker before going out to check the trash then he starts banging on the trash can and yells and then a little boy comes out and he's like please don't hurt me and he's like eating old food mm. oh it was so sad so now officers and benson stabler are on the scene the responding officer says the boy is probably about eight or nine he's really skinny and he had no coat on, even though it's winter. The boy is in the back of a cop car waiting for SVU to arrive. The responders thought if he was eating out of the trash can, he was probably abused. But Benson thinks he looks too clean to be a, quote, street kid. Stabler opens the door to the back seat and tries to talk to the kid. After some coaxing, he finally tells him his name is Jacob Nesbitt. The whole episode, every time they were like, Mrs. Nesbitt, all I thought about was that one scene from Toy Story where Buzz finds out that he's not really the real Buzz Lightyear and gets knocked into reality and he gets pretend hammered at a tea party with the other dolls at Sid's house. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. Sucking yeah. down Darjeeling with <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. <laughs> Nesbitt. <laughs> so Jacob tells Benson Stabler that he lives on 97th Street, which is a block away it's a half of two blocks away yeah. <laughs> yeah he lives with his mom and brother his dad is dead he asked detectives to not tell his mom he was eating and i was like oh my god is this going to be a boy called it that's immediately where i was like yeah a child called it yeah yeah, Chad called it. Now we're in the precinct. Jacob is being interviewed by Stabler. He's fucking chowing down a bunch of breakfast. He's got pancakes. He's never had them before. He says that there are all these rules for food, like what's good or not and how much he can have, etc. Jacob's brother also has food rules, but he doesn't break them like Jacob does. Oh. Jacob is punished when he breaks the food rules, but he won't tell Stabler what his punishment is. He doesn't want to talk about it. And he says his mom tells him, quote, what happens at home stays at home. On the other side of the glass in Craigan's office, I fucking meant to like go back and do one, and I fucking forgot. I did one. Yes, I was hoping. <laughs> I don't know why I did it. This was your thing. I'm so glad you did. On the other side of the glass in Craigan's groovy Volkswagen conversion van, Craigan's tripping <sighs> balls making veggie burritos to hand out in the parking lot at the next string cheese incident show. <laughs> Craigie says they have to let him go soon. Benson argues that Jacob is scared and doesn't want his mom to freaking know he was eating. Something is going on. Craigie mm -hmm. gives in and tells her to check out Jacob's mom while he calls to see if ACS has any info on the family. In the apartment of Marilyn Nesbitt, Benson and Stabler knock on the door and this teenage boy answers. He's been in a bunch of good stuff. The Strangers with Candy movie, Running with Scissors, Milk, Mind Hunter, Licorice Pizza. This is his first SVU appearance and he was just in another SVU episode that aired on April 6th, 2023. Weird. -ah. He was literally just in a new episode. Oh. Yeah. Wait, who was he in Mind Hunter? Uh, Benjamin Barnwright. It was the only character that I made a note of because I'm like, she's going to ask who he was in Mindhunter. And I don't remember and I'm not going to look into uh, it, but I'm going to put down his name. How'd for you game. know that I was going to? How'd you know I was going to ask that? Because I know you and I love you and I'll do anything for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go keep going. He tells them. To, <laughs> you're like, I'm full. <laughs> He tells them to wait in the hall while he gets his mom. Marilyn then comes to the door. They're like peeking through the crack of the door. Like they're not about to let these detectives inside. Uh -huh. The mom here, she plays Justine in Heat <laughs> with Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Val Kilmer, like awesome 90s movie. Do you remember that movie? Mm -hmm, kind of. I loved it in the 90s. I haven't seen it in a long time now, but. I mostly remember Jim Gaffigan's joke about Heat. <laughs> what he's like you when you don't watch a movie when it comes out he's like hey everybody have you seen heat and they're like yeah 10 years ago and they're like well i want to talk about it now oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah she also plays gloria capulet in the 1996 romeo and juliet movie oh this episode though this woman is giving uh marla singer from fight club in a sweater set i was just 
gonna fucking say that. Yeah. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's the hair. It's the hair. And her face. Her whole face. And her face. Okay, so Marilyn, this mom, she comes to the door and asks the detectives if their visit is about Jacob. Oh, your kid that they found eating out of the trash? That's yeah, about fucking Jacob, you bitch. Yeah. They tell her they want to talk to her about why she didn't report her son missing. Marilyn says she wasn't worried because Jacob runs away all the time and comes home and it's whatever. It's a it's a regular occurrence. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. But okay. Benson tells her that they found Jacob eating chicken out of the garbage can and they need to talk to her about it. So then you see her shift a little and she tells them she knows her rights and she doesn't have to let them into the apartment and they better bring Jacob home or she's going to call a lawyer and then she closes the door in their face and locks like 50 locks (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) then they lean into the door their mouths are an inch away from the door talking about her which I love like the second she closed the door they're like oh my god her reaction was super weird what a weird bit she asked super weird what's wrong with her what and then they both at the exact same time look down the hall and see this <laughs> neighbor lady goofy ass smiling at them from her door. She's got the door open to her apartment standing there like uh, looking at them and they make eye contact. And as they're like coming towards her, then she like starts closing the door. She's like, fuck. Yeah. Like, oh, I thought if I didn't move, they couldn't see me. But they walk towards her and they're like, hey, hey, hey. And she's like, oh, oh, hello. Yes. Oh, I just noticed you. <laughs> And they're like, can we talk to you about, you know? And she goes, yeah. So she lets him in. She serves them drinks and little snacks on a tray while they're chatting about Marilyn. She's happy to have them in her house. Mm-hmm. This neighbor says that Marilyn sends her muffins and has the boys come to help her with chores around her place. When she's asked about Jacob running away, she goes, he didn't run away. He's adventurous. He's a handful. So then she shares that Jacob's dad died while his mom was pregnant with him. Dad went out for milk one night and walked right mm. into a holdup and was shot. He was mm. killed by a 13-year-old boy. So now Marilyn stays home with the boys and homeschools them. Great. Now Benny and Staves are walking and talking with Iris Jordan. She's the Department of Education homeschool liaison. Marilyn has homeschooled the boys for seven years. She had pulled Adam out of school after second grade, and Jacob was never enrolled in public school. Marilyn's compliant with state requirements and follows a pretty rigorous curriculum. And Sailor's like, you can just fill out a form on the internet and take your kids out of school? Who would want to do that? I never see my fucking kids. Why would I do that willingly? <laughs> Iris says that they're lucky there are any regulations at all, and across the country there are probably a million kids being homeschooled she says going to school provides a safety net for some kids and can catch shit that may be missed in homeschool kids medical stuff psychological needs and obviously abuse benson asks if Marilyn was using homeschooling to hide abuse and iris tells them that they don't have any record of red flags but you should reach out to adam's former teachers Mm-hmm. Benny and Staves go to the school and are talking to Adam's second grade teacher. The teacher recalls that Adam was smart and sweet, but he had a lot of fears after his dad's murder and needed counseling. But his mom mm. wouldn't consent to counseling. The teacher's like, she was a fucking fruitcake and she had all these food restrictions and shit. I have no idea what was going on with that lady. Adam would come mm-hmm. to school hungry, but wasn't allowed to eat school lunch because mom said it was full of pesticides and preservatives. This to me, this teacher saying she would send nuts, raw vegetables, and protein drinks no seven-year-old would eat that and i know this isn't the point but american school lunch is garbage full of pesticides and <laughs> preservatives and right. kids eat all kinds of shit if you give them the opportunity mm-hmm. oh why even bother to feed kids healthy things i was like she was sending some balanced shit but oh. yeah that's not to say all of the other shit that was going on and that goes on later in the episode but at the time i was yeah. like that's not even weird. I thought that was weird. Stabler's like, well, did he eat her packed lunches? And she was like, would any seven-year-old? And I'm like, well, if they're hungry, they will. A hungry kid would. And this this person was not feeding her kids well, so he would have probably just ate the shit out of it. Yeah, I don't. I mean, mm-hmm. I guess I kind of get what they were trying the to say. The nuts and veggies and... It was just <laughs> very... Know. It was kind of an ignorant thing to say, because it's like, who would feed kids healthy options when there are chicken nuggets? Right, yeah. Things okay. have changed a lot. So at school, Adam would steal other kids' food and would throw up from eating too fast. The teacher would make appointments to talk with Marilyn about it, but she just wouldn't show up. She also had to threaten to report mom for neglect if she didn't come to a meeting. The next day, Marilyn pulled Adam out of school. During this whole conversation, Staler gets a call from Novak, and he pops into Benny, and he's like, she wants to see us. (laughs) Now. Benson Stabler meet with Novak and Denise Brock Morton. Oh, my God! It's fucking Julia Sugarbaker from Designing Women, <laughs> right? I don't know. Did you? <laughs> Designing Women? 
Okay. I mean, I know the show, but I'm embarrassed at how excited I am and how not excited you are. I'm sorry. She just was like an iconic character. Hmm. So Denise is the legal rep for the New York Homeschool League and Marilyn's attorney. Denise comes in fucking hot and tells them that they are harassing and persecuting Marilyn because she homeschools. Shut mm-hmm. the fuck up. Nobody gives a shit. Right. In this scene, Stabler has such a sassy boy attitude, and I super like it right now. I hate it in general, mm-hmm. but he is doing that. He's like, like in the background, like rolling his eyes, and he's, he's like smiling. Exactly. Like, the smug, deep sigh white man while a woman's talking fucking bullshit that he's doing. <laughs> right. I love it here because I'm like, fuck you, Denise. But normally I'm like, what's that now? Like, I would check a man so fucking hard if they responded to me like that. Are you kidding? Even you, Sabler. Benson's like, bro, no one's being persecuted. We're just asking a few fucking questions. Jeez. Jeez. (laughs) Denise is like, while you're holding Jacob hostage. Stabler says they had to investigate because Marilyn wouldn't let them in the door. And I'm like, "Mm, she doesn't have to, though, you know? Right. He's irritated by this lady, of course. Eye rolly, blah, blah, blah. Novak says that Benny and Staves are just trying to ensure that Jacob is returned to a safe home. And Denise is like, their home is more than adequate. It's fine. And then Novak goes, prove it. So now we're at Marilyn's apartment. The main room is set up like a fucking school. Literally. Mm -hmm. It looks like a school. Benson asks where the boys sleep, and she shows them to a room. Adam is in the room doing homework. There's like bunk beds and stuff. Benson asks him if he ever goes online, and Marilyn answers for him. Only educational sites. When Benson asks about his hobbies, Marilyn again answers for him and says, Learning is the boy's passion. (laughs) And I'm like, you are an awful person. Yeah. When they're walking towards the kitchen, Stabler asks her how the kids get exercise. Marilyn tells them they do morning calisthenics, and the homeschooling league does weekly athletic events in Central Park, which I highly doubt they get to go to. Mm -hmm. And then Benson points out that Adam looks small for his age, and Marilyn says he's perfect. Stabler asks her if he gets enough to eat, and Marilyn points out that there is plenty of healthy food to eat and makes statements against processed food and beef and mad cow disease. She opens the cupboards, and there's like a ton of food in there. Mm -hmm. Denise is like, that's enough. Unless a balanced diet is a crime, then we're done. And we're done. Now we're at the precinct. Stabler is fucking pissed and stomping around. A social worker from ACS, Steve Cross, says that they need to let Jacob go home. Like, now. This guy Mm -hmm. has the lower half of Harvey Keitel's face. Oh, I can't picture it. (sighs) Okay, then I'm going to make you picture it. So, Harvey Keitel, (laughs) Dolores Van Cartier's estranged boyfriend in Sister Act, why she has to go into hiding at the convent. Remember, he's like, Dolores. And then he, like, tries to Oh, yeah, that guy. I like how that's what I have to go to to get you to remember Harvey Keitel when he's literally the wolf from Pulp Fiction. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Benson wants Jacob to stay in a foster home overnight since they aren't done investigating. But Steve says they can't do that without a significant statement of abuse from Jacob. Stabler tells him to look at Jacob on the other side of the glass and tells Steve that he's terrified of his mom. Steve is just rational. He's like, dudes... (laughs) He has to go home. Mm -hmm. Steve says Jacob told him he wants to go home, and Benny and Stabes are arguing with him about Jacob being malnourished. Steve says Jacob isn't actually malnourished. Stabler says that Marilyn uses food to control him. Cragen says it sounds like Jacob is being emotionally abused, but Steve said that that's super hard to prove. Stabler goes in to talk to Jacob and gives him his number so he can call him anytime. Yeah. Marilyn and Denise come in to get Jacob. Stabler tells Jacob, like, hey, maybe sometime we can go get pancakes. And Jacob is like, if mom says it's okay. And then Jacob is rushed out of the room. Steve tells Marilyn that he'll see them in the morning at 9 a.m. And Marilyn's like, we'll be there. And I was like, oh, my God, something bad's going to happen. Yes. We are just kicking off a dad episode if we've ever had one. Mm-hmm. Cut to Stabler's house. Stabler's playing a board game with Dickie. Oh, they are having the best time. Kathy's <laughs> watching. She's taking in this moment of really being able to appreciate number one dad in action. Stabler mm. gets a call, so he drops Dickie to the ground with, <laughs> with a thud. <laughs> he goes, Kathy. She's like, Dickie, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Stabler's like, another person's kid needs me. Fuck off, Dickie. 
The call is from Jacob. It's a little boy who needs him. Dickie will just talk to his therapist about it later. It's fine. <laughs> Stabler leaves to go check on the boy. So he heads over to Marilyn's apartment, and the door is open when he gets there. So mm -hmm. he's going in. The string music is fucking intense. There's like nine violinists following the detectives around all the time. There's a full fucking orchestra. <laughs> There's just a dude with one of those <laughs> huge parade drums that they have to wear with a harness over their <laughs> shoulders, and he's just like hoofing it after toots during a chasing. He's like, doom, doom. <laughs> like running, trying to keep up, <laughs> holding on his little hat, you know, a little too small for his head as a tiny red feather. It's a full parade. So right now, Stabler's just got the string section and they're all tiptoeing in and they're like, wee, wee, wee. the lights are off. Stabler calls out and nobody answers. He goes mm -hmm. inside the apartment and sees Jacob pass out on the floor with a phone next to him. But when Staves gets closer, he can see a pool of blood around Jacob's head. He checks mm -hmm. his pulse and Jacob is dead. Mm -hmm. Now Marilyn's apartment is a crime scene. Everybody's there. Jacob was killed by a single gunshot to the temple and there was a gun found by his right hand. Benson asks if it was a suicide and Stabler goes, uh, not a chance in hell. Right. The gun was jammed when someone tried to chamber a second round, which you can't really do mm. if you've shot yourself in the head. Right. So we learn that he had died between 10 and 9 p.m. And Jacob had called Stabler at 9.07. Absolutely no word from Marilyn or Adam has come in. Benny takes a knee in front of Stabler and reminds him that, hey, you, hey, it's not your fault that Jacob died. ACS was the ones who sent him home. And Stabler's like, screw ACS. I knew something was wrong. I watched that boy walk out the door. I appreciate how much he cares, but also when we have to zoom out and look at the legal system, you can't hold someone's kid on a hunch, you know? Yeah, you, I mean, that would be illegal. <laughs> yeah. So now we're at the precinct. Benson, Craig, and Wong are doing a little walk and talk. There's no leads in where Marilyn could be. Craigan wonders why only Jacob got killed and not Adam. Huang says that abusive parents tend to single out one kid, and if Adam obeys and Jacob didn't, that could be why he didn't get enough to eat or was murdered. Benson thinks she probably tried to kill Adam, but the gun jammed. Huang thinks that maybe she already killed him and is out dumping the body. And I'm like, this conversation is so fucking crazy. Mm hmm Craigan wants to know what the fuck her motive could be to kill her own fucking children. And Huang equates Marilyn to the Greek tragedy Medea. Ah, uh, yes. Tyler Perry's If Medea yeah. Can't Have You, Then Nobody Will. It was a <laughs> terrible movie. Oof. Sorry. Sorry, was yeah. that too dark? <laughs> but yeah, this Medea killed her children so no one could take them from her. Mm -hmm. ACS was supposed to come back the next morning at 9, so she may have killed them to spite ACS. Munch has phone records. Marilyn has only spoken to Denise those past few days. Stabler found financial records that show Marilyn has been living off her husband's life insurance money, and it's getting real low. She has no other income. Oh, God, can you imagine? Like, not even a break from your mom? Oh, my God, I would die. I know. Credit cards have been flagged just in case she uses them. So Toots gets off the phone with the DMV. There is a car registered to Maryland. It has an old ass form of a GPS called autopilot, uh -huh. where if you get lost, you can hit a button and someone will tell you where to go. It's like OnStar, kind of. Yes. Yeah. Autopilot like is GPS, so they can track it. Mm -hmm. Craig tells them to get a court order to take them to the GPS company so they can track the car. The way they're talking about the GPS is hilarious, I too, because they're like, they can track a car? Fucking satellites? Are we in space? <laughs> it was this whole oh i yeah, love this I this is this is what i, I love i was just going through the nostalgia of the early svu episodes and like this is one of those peak the, the technology of it is so great to watch right so now we're at autopilot gps navigation systems an employee who i fucking like love her she's like 90s tech lady and for some reason to me i was like who's this benny's fucking stunt double they had a similar look yeah benny's like standing behind her going oh, that's how i'm gonna get my hair cut next <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I mean, she had, yeah. She's a little worried and makes sure that the request is legal before entering the VIN number to the car into the system. Mm -hmm. She's like, is this legal? And they're like, we have a fucking thing. Just do it, lady. So the car is tracked to the Bronx and it's not moving. They were like, you got to go call us if they move. And she's like, I'll do you one better. <laughs> and gives them this mobile device to track the car. <laughs> So they can see if the car starts moving. And it looks like an old 90s arcade game. You know, those little like handheld. It's a fucking, it's a... It's a Tom Tom with a Crayola marker drawing of a few streets on it. it is, <laughs> yeah, it is. That's a, yeah. It's so bad. <laughs> it's so bad. So Benson Stabler are driving to the car's location. They have the tracker thingy. It's so stupid and funny. It's a big, um, bright, blinking red light. Boop, boop. <laughs> oh, there she is. Boop, boop. 
It's like submarine fucking (laughs) sonar shit. But from the 60s. Yeah. (laughs) So the car is at a strip mall. There's no blood and no body in the trunk. Benson thinks that they dropped the car off and then they met someone at the strip mall. Benson makes a call to Munch to call the Board of Education. They want to find out if there's any other people that belong to the same homeschool group as Marilyn live nearby. Now Benson and Stabler are walking up to a house on the list of contacts that Munch found. The orchestra's just off camera. Woo, woo, woo. Nancy Kester, who homeschools her daughter, answers the door. This lady takes the lead for actor that we've seen on SVU with the most soap opera episodes under her belt. Mm. 606 episodes of (gasps) Guiding Light. What? Holy shit. 104 episodes of All My Children. Nobody does it better than Nancy Kester. Nancy answers the door and seems really confused when they start asking about Marilyn. Because they're like, when was the last time you saw Marilyn? She's like, oh my god, when her car broke down at the mall, you guys. Do you know where she is now? She's like, she's in the kitchen making cookies with my daughter and Adam. What's this about? (laughs) So they push in past her and she's like, ah! So they bust into the kitchen and they're making cookies with non-organic flour, P.S. So I don't know what this shit's about. I know. They weren't really consistent because why is she sending that lady muffins? She's not, she's not making muffins. She's not making muffins. And why, why is she fuck? sending them bricks made of bananas and protein powder? Like, what is she? <laughs> yeah. She sure shit isn't letting her kid touch cookie fucking batter or whatever the fuck it's called. Dough. Yeah. Even though if this is what mm, Jacob may have thought that his brother had all the same rules but maybe he didn't you know Mm. i don't know we'll talk about it during the chaser yeah benny and staves are like you guys need to come with us and Marilyn's freaking out yelling go away go away don't take my son i laughed so hard when she when she was screaming (laughs) go away like they were gonna be like sorry bye i know and then adam's like oh my god i'm gonna freak out too ah no he's fighting and so Marilyn takes his freak out and is like oh wait i need to calm down i love you adam everything's gonna be okay be a man she says be a man a bunch she's like don't say anything be a man ew be a man Benson arrests Marilyn for the murder of Jacob. At the precinct, Marilyn and Denise are in an interview room with Benny and Stabes. Marilyn's crying and saying, why are you doing this? My son is dead and now you're persecuting me. Like, bitch, we're investigating a fucking murder. And stop using the word persecuting. Nobody Ugh. gives a shit that you homeschool your kids, you stupid bitch. Oh. Also, like, I, th- I don't know. It's just I, we don't even have to get into why it's so annoying because it's like, dude, your son was dead in your apartment and you and your other son were gone and abandoned your car in a parking. Like, what do you think we're fucking we're just going to go Oh, when you finish those cookies? Could you maybe just answer a few questions for us? If not, if you don't feel like it, I know you're having a hard time. It's like, shut up. Right. Denise goes, kids play with guns. Accidents happen. She also claims that they can't prove that Jacob was murdered. Benson tells her that the ballistics lab actually excluded a self-inflicted injury Marilyn's lawyer denise keeps challenging the shit that they're bringing to her and she's like Mm -hmm. um let me guess you don't even have her prints on the gun and stabler's like actually we don't there's a fucking textured grip which is bullshit Mm -hmm. and denise goes what possible motive could my client have i don't know maybe literally just skirting acs and being looked into by svu but you know Mm -hmm. stabler asks Marilyn where she got the gun and she said that she bought it for protection these are my notes in this moment i hope there's not some crazy twist that i'm missing because i fucking hate this lady and i want to drown her in a toilet (laughs) but i'm just like having this seething anger toward her and i'm like i know this is how i'm supposed to be feeling toward this woman but are they gonna fucking flip it on me and she's a victim in some way Mm -hmm. denise he says Marilyn will take the responsibility for having an unlicensed handgun, but she didn't kill Jacob. Stabler asked Marilyn why she ran away when Jacob was shot, and Marilyn says she wasn't there. She was at the store. And the way that she said this, she's got her head down crying, and she's like, when I came home, Jacob was... <gasps> and she looked up at them like, are you guys buying this? And then goes back to, <laughs> dad on the floor. <laughs> it was hilarious. <laughs> oh, yeah, she sucked. Adam was home and Marilyn said he was too scared to speak to her when she got home. And I'm like, honey, you did not answer the question. Later on the other side of the glass, Munch got proof that Marilyn was at the store. She went to multiple stores, in fact. The clerks remember her, of course, because it's New York City and everybody remembers everybody. Of course. Why wouldn't they? (laughs) And the credit card statements show the same activity. Some of the stores even had her on videotape. There's no way she shot Jacob. Stabler's like, maybe it was an accident. So Benson and Stabler are now in an interview room with Adam. They know he was the only one there and he needs to tell them what happened. He says he doesn't want to talk about it. And I'm like, dude, your brother is dead. You're in a police station. What do you mean you don't want to talk about? Like, what the fuck? Why even say that? Like, I don't want to talk about it. Well, you kind of, you have, you, you got to talk about it, mm. you know? 
Yeah, he's a kid too, though. I know. Benson says that Marilyn must have been pretty pissed Jacob ran off. And then Adam's like, my mom loves us. And then he says that Jacob tells them lies about Marilyn all the time. And he was convinced that ACS was going to take them away. Stabler tells him that's not true. They just wanted to check on them and make sure they were okay. Adam does not believe Stabler and says that they were going to put them in foster care. And then he's like, the kids in the system are abused and molested. I could take care of myself, but Jacob was too little. And then Stabler says, and that's why you took your mom's gun to protect your brother? And the music gets all swelly. Benson tells Adam that if it was an accident, he won't get in trouble, but he has to tell them what happened. Mm-hmm. Adam t- Tasha. <laughs> I'm sad. <laughs> you just like this tiniest little like. <laughs> Adam tells him that he got the gun from his mom's closet and he told Jacob to shut his eyes and then he fucking shot him. Oh my God. Adam says that Jacob is in a better place and nothing can hurt him now. And I'm like, what the, f- oh my fucking God. Now we're at the courthouse. Adam's lawyer, isn't she from Dexter? Is she <gasps> like. It's fucking Lieutenant Maria LaGuerta from Dexter. Yeah, Dexter. Yep. She appears in SVU as attorney Shamal just twice in seasons five and six. Oh, but mm. like. I love her. I love her. Yeah, I was pretty. I'm like, th- she's from Dexter. But then I was like, is that where am I remembering that right? But I was. I like how you remember that. But you were like, is Serena Williams. <laughs> is this a person that I should know? <laughs> I'm like, she looks like a young Serena Williams. You're like, because she is. <laughs> she is fucking Serena Williams. <laughs> she's awesome she's cute and awesome yeah i love her mouth and the way that she talks (gasps) yes uh so she pleads not guilty for reason of mental disease or defect adam speaks up and tells the judge that his attorney is fucking wrong he says he did it and he's guilty and he knows he has to go to jail the judge is like whoa (laughs) tell your client that his statements can be used against him and his lawyer is like um i want the confession taken off the record (laughs) please can we do that and Novak and Adam's lawyer go back and forth. Novak thinks that the confession shows that he knows right from wrong, so they can't use the mentally disturbed adolescent thing. And then his lawyer is like, actually, it shows that he's mentally disturbed. Mm. And they're just fighting back and forth. The judge orders an exam and says that he will be labeled as not guilty until after, quote, the shrinks weigh in. At the Bellevue Hospital prison ward, Huang and Adam are talking. Adam tells Huang that bad stuff happens to kids. They get kidnapped and molested all the time. The boys being homeschooled was so much safer, and it protected them from things like Columbine. And Huang, in 2004, mm. is like, you know, school shootings are pretty rare. Cut to 2023 when my <laughs> kindergartner and second grader have regular intruder drills. But okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's no other place in the entire world that has that. You know that? I hate it here. <sighs> I don't know. So Adam tells Huang that it's not just the shootings, dude. School also has drugs and gangs and bullies. And he is telling him in this feverishly fearful Mm -hmm. way you can see that all of his mom's anxieties have just kind of seeped into him and he believes all of it Mm -hmm. and also his dad did die by a random awful thing happening and it's kind of Mm -hmm. dictated everything in his life ever since Mm -hmm. adam says that everything was fine at home until jacob messed it all up adam wasn't mad at him though he says that he shot his brother to save him from something horrible happening he had to do it because he's better off dead than being raped and abused in a foster home like this kid truly believes everything he's saying yeah after this interview huang talks to novak and he says that adam is competent to stand trial but definitely has clinical paranoia and emotional problems marilyn convinced adam that danger was around every corner and the only safe place was home so novak wonders if marilyn is just as guilty as adam is and it's like catch the fuck up novak yeah (laughs) right huang compares it to a case in connecticut where the woman didn't get her son help after being told repeatedly to do so and as a result he hung him himself Mm. and she was convicted for that he thinks marilyn is responsible for jacob's death because adam didn't get the counseling he needed even though she had been told repeatedly to get him help and novak's like Mm -hmm. he killed his brother i can't cut a deal with him he's fucking guilty and huang's like oh my god da's cut deals with guilty people all the fucking time i sit back and i watch you fucking do it all the time figure Mm -hmm. it out and then she sighs and tilts her head at him (laughs) Her, her response was (sighs) <sighs> yeah novak goes to talk to former judge mary clark well hello marlo thomas she's been acting since 1960 she's been in a ton of stuff she shows up three more times as judge mary clark this season marlo thomas is a very well-known actor correct hmm. well oh. i don't know oh she <laughs> right. is cool 
Clark is no longer a judge and is a private practice lawyer. She's making her and Novak fancy little martinis. I thought they were like at a bar, but they were like in her office or house or something. I don't know. It's really cute. Yeah. The judge tells her to stop calling her judge, first of all. And while they're having drinks, call me Mary and goes, <laughs> she made this like weird. Did you hear that? <laughs> No. She like made some <laughs> weird fucking noise afterwards. It was so small, but she's like, Ugh. "Call me Mary." It makes <laughs> it was like it was even quieter than that. I was like, "What was that?" <laughs> Call me Mary. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go back, dude. Call me okay. Mary. <laughs> Call me Mary. <laughs> when we're having drinks, call me Mary. I. <laughs> When we're having drinks, call me Mary. Wee <laughs> When we're having drinks, call me Mary. <laughs> when we're having drinks, <laughs> I, I, I saw you just look it off. You're thinking. When we're having drinks, call me Mary. Oh, you are? <laughs> Get back here. Get back here right now. I'm not done talking to you. I said go to your room, and when I say go to your room, you listen. I don't care who's here. I don't care if it's your friends, your aunt, your uncle, the postman. I don't care. Go to your room. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Novak asks for advice. She really doesn't want to indict Adam. And then she's like, I used to not feel this way. And then Mary's like, yeah, it's a lot more simpler when you're doing lawyer shit for white collar folk. Is that how she said that? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a lot more simpler when you're doing lawyer shit. <laughs> for, for white collar folk. That's just, I don't know why I wrote it that way. Yeah, so SVU has way more nuances. Mm -hmm. Novak says that she thinks Adam is like a ventriloquist dummy for his mom. Mm -hmm. Mary asks if parents are responsible for their children's actions. Novak says that's the question. And I don't have an answer. Mary tells Novak to find the answer and to figure out how she feels. Does Novak feel like Adam should be charged? Did Adam have intent? And why isn't he rebelling against his mom like a normal teen? He can't. I hear that. You know, trauma makes kids do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So I feel like rebelling against his mom like a normal teen, I don't know if that really... He's not a normal teen. You know what I mean? No. Like he's in prison pretty much and, and kids that are homeschooled in my experience have a different level of socialization obviously mm -hmm. and yeah. they socialize differently and behave differently in group it's i mean it's fucking studied it's known right so now we're back at the kester residence that's the house where they found marilyn and adam making cookies mm -hmm. mrs kester says adam was serious and intense but gentle and never violent Polly. Her daughter and Adam's little homeschool friend says Adam never really talked to her about his mom. Polly leaves because she's got to study French so Novak can talk to her, Mrs. Kester alone. Mrs. Kester says that Polly is super confused by everything that's happened. And Polly had a little crush on Adam and Marilyn didn't really like it. So she stopped coming around. In fact, Mrs. Kester was surprised to hear from her when their car quote broke down by the mall. Mrs. Kester says Marilyn didn't seem to want the kids to have friends at all, let alone a girlfriend. She kept the boys a little too close for her comfort. It made her wonder if homeschooling was healthy for Marilyn's kids. She says that people do homeschooling for different reasons, like religion or not being able to afford private tuitions or just not liking fucking busy ass public schools. She says that she thinks Marilyn wanted just complete control of the boys. It mm -hmm. could have been her way of keeping them safe. Novak leaves and then Polly runs after her and she's like, I think I should give you this. Gives her some papers and runs off. She's such a bad actor. <laughs> I know it was terrible. <laughs> the way she runs off, I was just like, "Oh, Tasha, this is her only role she ever." Did that thing where you like, you like kick your butt while you're running, <laughs> you know? <laughs> she learned how to run from watching DJ Tanner on Full House go to her room. Right, you run like <laughs> a guy <laughs> pretending he's DJ Tanner. <laughs> Let's go to prison. Cut to Novak at the prison sitting with Adam. The papers were emails that Polly had printed out and Novak's reading them to Adam. Mm. Quote, my mom keeps telling me stuff that scares me. I want to run away, but I can't leave Jacob. They were from Adam to Polly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fucking Adam's like, those are my emails. Where did you get those? <laughs> He sounded like that Vanessa Bayer character. Who um, does the SNL. kid. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> oh, where did you get those? 
Adam gets nervous and tells Novak, Don't tell my mom. I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> Adam wrote Polly the night Jacob died, and it said, quote, My mom wants me to do something. I don't know what to do. Novak asks mm. him what his mom wanted him to do. And he's all freaking out and getting worked up. Adam says it's too late. He isn't supposed to be there, that he should be dead too. And Novak mm. realizes the second shot, the one that jammed, was for himself. He shot mm -hmm. Jacob, then planned to shoot himself. Mm. No. In the precinct, Novak's discussing everything with the squad. She is fucking pissed. She's like, that bitch is responsible, but I can't touch her. The emails mm -hmm. don't implicate Marilyn in Jacob's death. Mm -hmm. They can't prosecute her for pushing her world views onto her kids. Otherwise, every single parent in every single country would be going to jail for anybody that like wasn't violent because of religion yeah and also to your point she says you can raise your kids to be a racist as long as it doesn't cause harm and i was like um wait mm. <laughs> you can't have one without the other like right. you're not gonna be racist and not cause harm like you can't ex you're gonna exist just yeah just you existing is causing harm <laughs> uh and we're Nothing. talking about all of us okay stabler says the case is like vehicular homicide adam is the car marilyn is the driver huang wonders if marilyn can be charged with causing jacob's murder maybe not with murder but with facilitating it her gun her fears her beliefs legally it's a long shot and then benny stands up and goes so we got nothing to lose and then they all huddle up and put their hands in the middle go us <laughs> Benny and Staves are now chilling on Marilyn's stoop when she walks up. They arrest her for the criminal facilitation in Jacob's murder. And she's like, oh, Jesus Christ. So annoying. Eye roll. Ugh. I know. I know. The way she acted when they arrested her was like, can I at least get these peas in the freezer? Ugh. <laughs> I know. It was Your wild. son is dead. Your kids are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was weird. She's clearly got mental health stuff, obviously, yeah. because the complete disconnect is very present yeah yeah so now we're in the precinct juan is speaking with marilyn he tells her that he evaluated adam and she's like whatever so you think he's crazy her attitude this whole scene is fucking wild mm -hmm. wong says no he doesn't think adam's crazy but he is very fearful marilyn says he's smart because he knows the dangers of the world marilyn says she grew up with no home no mom or safety so she doesn't fucking sugarcoat the truth wong asks her how jacob responded to the quote truth she says that he thought she was being unfair and then she says but life isn't fair isn't it in it yeah if it was my husband would be alive my son would be alive none of this would have happened if jacob had listened to me oh my god you stupid bitch wong asks her how jacob would disobey her and she says that he would never accept that she knew what was always right for him and then Wong says, sometimes even good parents make mistakes. Marilyn asks Wong if he has kids, and he's like, no. And she's like, yeah, I thought so. And then she calls our sweet, precious angel Wong a short little man with a nasty little mind. Mm. I was like, oh, she mm -hmm. thinks he's trying to twist her words and that he thinks she's stupid. She's like, will you just call my lawyer? It was crazy. <laughs> then we go on the other side of the glass, Novak there, and she's like, what the hell was that? And Wong's like, I don't know. Who cares? She's a dumb bitch. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Wong says it's her way of handling stress. And then they look through the glass and she's just fucking casually reading a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And Novak is like, how the hell can she be reading the paper like nothing happened? Wong thinks that Marilyn has borderline personality disorder. She compartmentalizes the world. People who question her are not only wrong, but also her enemies, including her kids. Mm hmm. And Novak's like, so she doesn't even love them. He says, it's a narcissistic form of love. As soon as her kids show any individualism, she perceives it as rejection and an attack. Maybe she was abused. Maybe had a weird attachment shit with her mom. But her husband's murder is what unleashed her paranoia. Mm -hmm. Novak's going to run this shit by a judge because it might be enough. All right, now we're in the judge's chambers. The judge is listening to these two lawyers as he relaxes in the sun on the rocky shoreline after a big lunch of clams, shrimp, and sea cucumbers. <laughs> He's a walrus. <laughs> I would that be funny if he was on the stand and every now and then he would be like, look at the bailiff and he would throw him a fish. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Counselor, <laughs> continue. <laughs> he screams to the bailiff, "Macro me!" <laughs> well, delicious. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now we're in the judge's chambers. Denise says that Marilyn being charged for facilitating her son's murder is dang ludicrous. And all I could think of was ludicrous. Luda! Luda! Yeah. <laughs> Novak 
Mike says Adam shot Jacob because Marilyn told him that they would be better off dead than in foster care. Ugh. Then she left her frightened kids home alone with a loaded gun. And Denise is like, oh, you can read minds now? So you knew what was going to happen? And we're like, uh, Novak says, um, I don't need to read minds, but I read Adam's emails. Oh. My mom wants me to do something? What does that mean? The judge says that they have no idea what Adam meant by that, but Novak says that Marilyn made sure that Adam thinks only what she wants him to think. Denise jumps in and is still stuck on Marilyn being prosecuted for choosing to homeschool because the government doesn't approve of homeschool. And the judge is like, so you're saying this is like some political fucking what? Denise pronounces it like homeschool. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch that at all. Homeschool. Mm. Denise says that if Adam had shot a kid while in public school, they wouldn't be charging his mom. But I gotta argue that if he was in public school, he wouldn't be like locked inside all day, mm -hmm. not being able to socialize. Which has its own set of not goods. Like public school has its shit mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. sure. But it, that that comparison doesn't apply in this situation to me. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Yeah. The judge says that the facilitation charge is legal and it will go to the grand jury. Denise hands Novak a notice and says Marilyn will testify at the grand jury. And she thinks the jury will be sympathetic to a grieving mother. Fuck off, lady. At the New York State Supreme Court, Novak is questioning Marilyn now. This soppy bitch claims to not know what Adam was going to do. What? <laughs> <laughs> this soppy bitch. Oh, I just hated her. I hated the way she was sitting there. I, she looked like a fucking turd in a silk shirt. I hated her so much more in this scene than any other one. But she claims to not know what Adam was going to do while she was gone. Novak says mm -hmm. that Marilyn just wanted an airtight alibi, which is why she ran a bunch of errands, including a stop at the pharmacy to fill a prescription for Jacob a week fucking early. And Marilyn's like, mm, mm -hmm. I just wanted to be prepared. So... Novak points out that Marilyn was careful to stay in the view of the security cameras and pay with a credit card, even though it was just a $5 prescription. Marilyn responds by saying she knows how, quote, you people work, claiming that if she paid with cash and had no record of buying his pills, she'd be getting charged with medical neglect. So everybody's right. out to get you, Mrs. Nesbitt. She's like, I never said that, but it's clear you don't approve of how I'm raising my sons. Marilyn keeps referring to mm -hmm. her children as if they're both still alive, by the way. And, oh, here come the violins. They're running in, wiping off their mouths because they were in the <laughs> middle of lunch. God damn it. <laughs> she leans forward, staring at Novak, and tells her that they're trying to take her children away from her. The police, DAs, Dyfus, you destroy families. Marilyn then warns mm. the rest of the room with her fucking waggly, bony-ass finger mm. to be careful right. because if they don't live their lives the way that they want them to, points at Novak, like Novak's got some fucking skin in the game, then they'll come after their kids too. I was surprised they allowed her to talk to the jury and shit for I so know. long without an obje objection. I know. It's almost like it didn't really happen. Back in <laughs> Novak's office, Benny and Stabes come in. Novak had sent them an emergency notice. She's like, I got to talk to you guys. I got some new dish. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know. So Benny and Stabes, they run in. They're wiping oh. their mouths. They just finished lunch. They're like, what? <laughs> they snuck in meatball subs. <laughs> they snuck in meatball Novak's like, you guys, new dish. During the trial, Marilyn referred to the New Jersey State Division of Youth and Family Services. She said fucking Dyfus when she was going on her rant. She didn't say ACS, which is basically the same thing, but it's in New York. OK, mm -hmm. and Benson's like, why would a New Yorker call the ACS an out of state name? Road trip, <laughs> holiday road. Oh. <laughs> Benny and Saves are going to go to Jersey while Novak stalls the grand jury. They've got that kind of time. Yeah. At the Division of Youth and Family Services, an employee can't find a record on Marilyn, Jacob or Adam in the system for Benny and Saves. Dude, usually when I look up people and they have a tiny role like this, there's not a lot that follows. It's just kind of like, oh, this is a whatever. This fucking woman, this is Marceline who got, and she has 113 acting credits. She's fucking mm. Gladys in The Leftovers. <gasps> Who's Gladys? I don't remember the, Gladys. She's the one. Okay, I knew you were going to. She's the one. She's like one of the two that are always chain smoking, and then they don't talk, but then she gets stoned to death. Remember? <gasps> oh, yeah. That whole thing, and then it turns out it was a setup, whatever. She's also Barbara Lazaro in What We Do in the Shadows. 
Barbara Lazaro. She's the the president of the Staten Island Borough Council. He's like, oh, I'm going to go talk to Barbara Lazaro. I can't remember. I have to look her up. She's been in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Evil, Dr. Death, Ozark, Better Call Saul, Nurse Jackie. Tons and tons of shit. She is like what? a tiny blip of a character in this episode. So she's, she's this employee at the Division of Youth and Family Services at DIFUS. She first tries searching by birth dates and first names. A match for Marilyn Chesterfield and Adam come back from 1995 when Jacob wasn't born yet. Mm -hmm. This child was coming to school with welts and bruises and says that his mm -hmm. mom beat him. The child's name was Daniel, Adam's older brother. We've never heard of you. I totally forgot about this part. The detectives go to speak with Daniel. Daniel says his mom was always a little crazy, like weird diets and stuff. He says dad kept her from going off the deep end. When their dad got killed, she completely lost it. Move them to Jersey and change their name to Chesterfield. Daniel says his dad went to the store the day he was killed because Daniel wanted milk for his cereal. Mm. And fucking Marilyn blamed him for his dad dying so she would beat him. Daniel was 13, Adam was 6, and Jacob wasn't born yet. Daniel told his teachers about the abuse. Marilyn never came to court for his case and no one could find her. Daniel stayed in the system till he was 18. She just abandoned him. Mm -hmm. Daniel stayed in the system till he was 18. Then he joined the Navy. He thought about contacting her, but shit got better once he was away from her. Nobody hit him. His foster parents are good people. And he kind of thought he was just better off. Daniel feels really bad for leaving Adam with his mom, but she never hit him. And he thought Adam would be fine. Then he gets choked up and he's crying and he's like, I should have gone back. I, I could have stopped all of this. Mm. Benson's like, dude, you didn't know. This isn't your fucking fault. And then Stabler's like, but look, Adam needs you now. Ugh. In the prison, Daniel goes with Novak to see Adam, but it's all dark. Adam tells Novak he doesn't want to talk about his mom and faces a different direction. He didn't see Daniel at all. Novak tells Adam to just listen. And then all of a sudden, Daniel says, hello, Adam. Adam is like, oh, my God, and turns around and he's like, who are you? And he's like, I'm your fucking brother, dude. Mm -hmm. Adam doesn't believe him. Marilyn told him that Daniel got killed in foster care. Jesus. Novak says that she lied and fucking Adam does not believe her. Daniel says he never stopped thinking of him and shows him a photo of them to prove to him that he is who he says he is. And it's them like he was teaching him to ride a bike and it was really cute. Adam realizes that Marilyn lied about everything. And Novak says she lied about that night and what happened to Jacob, didn't she? Just tell me what happened. Adam says that Marilyn was so mad at Jacob when they brought him home and kept yelling about them going to foster care and that they would be raped and killed like Daniel. Jesus. Mm. Marilyn told Adam that if he was brave, he could stop that from happening. Marilyn gave Adam the gun and told him that they would all be together in heaven with their dad, Daniel. Oh, my God. Adam tells Novak he shot Jacob and she holds him in her lawyer arms while he cries. It's fucking so sad. The way that he laid his head in her lap, she is not a bedside manner kind of lawyer. She's very mm -hmm. like cut and dry. So it was very robotic. He laid his head in her lap and she's like, there, there, <laughs> there, there, yeah. Adam. <laughs> this is parental, not sexual. It's a different kind of robot. <laughs> Blow your nose on my filter. <laughs> in this case, my filter is not sexual. It's not a vagina. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god your head bobble up <laughs> okay now we're in fucking novak's office benson novak adam denise and marilyn are all there denise tells novak that she could have sent the indictment to her office and then marilyn sees adam she's like adam he fucking busts in and confronts her about lying to him and telling him to shoot jacob she says to benson what have you done to my son daniel and stabler step in the room and daniel's like they told him the truth Hello, Mom. Marilyn's lawyer is like, what in the friggin' H-E double hockey sticks is going on here? Marilyn says it's a trick and still claims that Daniel is dead. She says, thanks to you, my whole family is dead and you're next. They'll kill you like they did your father. She's oh. carried out and is fucking keeps screaming at Adam to believe her. And that's the fucking Toyota of it all. That's the end. Ugh. It's fucking gross. No, thanks. All right, let's all get right. the chaser done. Let's just do it. <laughs> I started three different stories, uh, three mm -hmm. different chasers, and every single one of them was similar yet different, equally as difficult as the last. And I was like, oh, I know this story, so this won't be too hard for me emotionally. And nope, it was. 
It was hard. I'm going to tell you about David Pelzer. Mm. David Pelzer was born on December 29th, 1960 in the San Francisco Bay Area to Catherine and Stephen Pelzer. He was the third of five boys, and he has early memories of his strapping firefighter dad and loving mom. She was an amazing cook. Unfortunately, both of his parents were alcoholics, which was a fact that played a huge part in David's upbringing. And something in his mom shifted at one point early in David's life. He noticed that she behaved very differently when his dad was home or there was anyone else around. By age four, David was aware that he got in trouble a lot, especially when his mom was drinking, which was becoming more and more frequent and the punishments were increasingly severe. Mm. By the time David was in first grade, he had been singled out as Catherine's hyperfixation of torture. Now, they had mm. mentioned it in the episode. It's called target child selection it can also be called the cinderella phenomenon it's exactly as it sounds for whatever reason an abusive parent takes out all of their rage anger sadistic bullshit on one child also Catherine was never formally diagnosed but clearly was suffering from mental illness on top of an abusive upbringing herself combined with alcoholism it's often now speculated that she had borderline personality disorder I linked this whole blog post about it somebody goes through the memoir that he wrote and lining up things that happened in her behaviors with uh, borderline personality mm -hmm. symptoms and things like that if David would misbehave sometimes real sometimes only perceived by Catherine she had a series of escalating punishments that only grew in severity over the years like I had said initially yeah. she would press his face into a mirror and make him repeat the phrase I'm a bad boy she would look at the mirror with him and just mm. have him say it over and over while he looked at himself uh, she beat him regularly and he was so young he obviously didn't understand why he received such severe punishments when his brothers did not and David mm -hmm. decided that it was probably because he got caught more for their just regular kid shenanigans maybe his voice carried more or he just wasn't sneaky enough. And early on, it wasn't obvious what was happening behind closed doors. David's mom had even become den mother for his Boy Scout troop, and she was mm. kind in front of the other kids. This is when David would get a bit of a reprieve from her bullying, but that didn't last long. She quit his den mother and decided that he wasn't allowed to go to his Boy Scout meetings with his brothers anymore. Hmm. Once, very early on, as David was being beaten, a drunk Catherine stumbled and grabbed his arm as she fell, dislocating it, like pulled it mm. right out of its socket. Instead of tending to it, it was evening. She put him to bed. It was the top bunk. And in the morning, she told David, you don't remember this, but you fell out of the bed and that's how you got hurt. So we need to take you to the doctor. So she mm. then took him to the hospital where she dramatically told them the same story as if it had just happened. Like, oh, my little boy, my sweet boy. And David, mm. there are so many instances of him being hopeful that things would be different. Mm. And this was one of those times where he was just like, oh, maybe mom really gets it. You know, and then his dad came home and she told him the same story oh he fell out of bed and I ran and I tried to catch him and I couldn't catch him and it was this heroic moment of her motherhood but obviously that wasn't the truth she was doing mm -hmm. sadistic shit I'm going to tell you a few things that she did to him as a kid and these are really really extreme forms of abuse just trigger warning for anybody she would lock him in the bathroom with a mixture of bleach and ammonia which when combined produced a toxic gas it's literally mustard gas which would burn his lungs. He couldn't breathe. She also made him drink these chemicals as a form of punishment. Mm. So he has, to this day, um, esophageal issues, breathing issues. Well, and didn't sometimes, like, he would not breathe, and then she would come in and, like, revive him. Yes. Hit mm -hmm. him in the chest or whatever, get that, like, kind of gas bubble out of there. It's Wild. Mm -hmm. Another favorite form of punishment Catherine used was food restriction. David mm -hmm. would often be fed scraps of others' finished meals if he was fed at all. Instead of getting breakfast, he would be doing chores in the morning and standing in the garage during dinner at night. On average, he would go about three days without eating, but there were times that he went up to 10 days with only water. Mm. There were games she would play with him. Games. She would put food on a plate in front of him, telling him he only had two minutes to eat. And and when she would say go, as soon as he would grab his fork, she'd snatch the plate away. I heard him in an interview talking about this game. And she did it like three nights in a row once. And he said that on the third night, he decided that he wasn't going to grab the fork. He was going to just go into it with his face, which he did. And he got some of the food and felt like he had won something. Like it was this 
challenge mm-hmm. to survive. The scarcity of food got so bad for David that he spent years stealing food from his classmates at school, stealing from wherever he could, eating from dog bowls, uh, even eating dog excrement. Mm. There's a story in his book about him throwing up a hot dog and his mom forcing him to eat his own vomit. Mm -hmm. She was pissed that he got a hot dog. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. He wasn't allowed to look at anyone in his family. Like, she wanted his chin on his chest all the time. He couldn't play or watch TV with his brothers. He had to sleep under the kitchen table, covered only by newspaper. That Mm -hmm. sleeping situation was short-lived because he was eventually banished to sleep on a cot in the basement. She didn't even use his name after a while. She only called him the boy or it. He wore the same clothes every day for two years straight at one point. When he would go to school like this, because it's like, aren't people noticing this shit? He would go to school and he would have to sit by an open window in class because he smelled so strong. Mm -hmm. And with all this going on, you would think the other parent would be able to step up and be like, what the fuck, lady? But there were a few issues in that. Stephen, David's dad, worked 24-hour shifts at the firehouse. He was also Mm. an alcoholic. And when he was home, Catherine would curb her abuse of David. Like, it was much more subdued. It was still happening. He was still constantly in trouble. But it was way, way reduced when anybody else was around, especially his dad. Mm. But even what Stephen saw was enough to make him concerned. And he would sneak food scraps to David and quietly tell Mm. him the two of them were going to get out of there someday. I'm going to give her a piece of my mind one of these days. And David was always really hopeful that this was going to happen. But when, to the smallest extent, these things would happen, like if Stephen stood up to Catherine to defend David at all, when Stephen was gone again, she would take it out on David even worse. Mm. So the way David would describe his dad was as like a passive observer. Oh, God. But just his presence was enough to give him some relief from his mom Mm -hmm. and then it's like okay he's going to school like this he's going into public like this what about teachers or other trusted adults what's happening there when Mm -hmm. david was in the second grade there was a teacher who tried to help him at this time there were no laws in place regarding mandatory reporting of child abuse now it's against the law if teachers or doctors or whoever don't report you know that there's possible child abuse going on but at this time this teacher tried to report it and david's mom turned around and got that teacher fired for intruding into private family matters i thought he slept in the garage i also read a thing that said he slept in the garage and i think it was a couple places because in a couple interviews he did talk about being banished to the basement but then there Mm -hmm. were other times where he was in the garage so i think it was probably both just anywhere that wasn't in the main house because it's not like they had a finished basement, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I read that too and was like, what? But so so this treatment, all of this treatment that he's getting is for years of David's life. Yeah. And then something extreme happened. One day, Catherine and David were the only ones home. The other boys were at Scouts that she had pulled him out of. And she turned on the stove and made him put his arm over the burner. Mm. And he had to hold it there. She then told him to climb on top of the stove because she wanted to watch him burn. He had to think at this moment because he's like, this is going to kill me. Mm -hmm. And he was so used to this treatment but still had this survival thing in the back of his mind. Instead of burning him, he Mm. was like egging her on to beat him. And she did until his brother Ron came home. And he came home earlier than planned. So when she saw Ron coming in, she threw David to the basement. He's relieved. He avoided this thing happening to him. He got down there and he looked at his arm and he had blisters. It was second and third degree burns on his arm from this thing. But he had saved himself from being burned completely. And he's like, this pain in my arm means that I'm alive. If I can survive this, I can survive. And I can outthink her. I outthought her. And that's why I didn't get burned on my entire body on the stove. Because Mm -hmm. of my thinking. And this was a pivotal moment for him. So moving forward for David meant strategy and survival. He is a child. Mm -hmm. So he did this in other areas. So like the food restriction stuff. She caught him eating food out of the trash. And Mm. she started dumping bleach on the food scraps so he couldn't eat out of the trash. Everything would get thrown away. She would dump bleach in there. Then it would make it inedible. But he would do, you know, because he was doing all the cleanup and everything. So he would throw it away. He would put wax paper over the food. So when she dumped the chemicals on it, some of the food would be salvageable. Mm. That's fucking smart, you know. Mm -hmm. When David was 11... 
his mother was drunk, waving a knife at him in the kitchen. She stumbled and stabbed him in the abdomen, just beneath his heart. Mm. One of the interviews I listened to with him, he's talking about this occasion happening and what was going through his mind during this moment. It was so telling of an abuse victim. He said that when it happened, he's standing there, there's blood spilling everywhere, and all he could think about was, oh my God, I'm going to get to go to the hospital and have clean sheets. Like, this is great. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. So he went into the living room and was like, Dad, Mom stabbed me. His dad's reading the paper, and he doesn't look down from his paper. And he goes, you better get out of here before you cause any more trouble. I don't want any more hell from her tonight. Oh, my God. And that's when David lost faith in his dad because he was like, yeah. I'm, I, I mean, he's spurting blood. This is a half inch from his fucking heart, you know. Yeah. Um, and he didn't go to the hospital that night. His mom was actually a nurse before having kids. She patched it up and sent him to bed. Oh, she made him finish the dishes, actually, and then sent him to bed. Let's go to March of 1973. David's been living his entire childhood as an abused slave. There's no other way to put it. Like, that is what his life was. He barely talked. He was weak and emaciated from starvation and was basically surviving out of sheer determination. Mm -hmm. At this time, his mother had been talking about taking her four boys, not David, he didn't count, to stay the weekend at their uncle's house. David and Catherine would be alone for days, and that was always when the abuse was the absolute worst. David's father wasn't living at home anymore because his parents had separated a few weeks after his 12th birthday. I mean, just a few months prior. So this this is coming up. This weekend is coming up. And he's freaking out because he's like, I can't be alone at the house with mom for a whole fucking weekend. On that Thursday of that week, Catherine had come up with a new punishment for David. Uh, she had a punishment of the day for him. She had made the mixture of ammonia and bleach and had David dunk his limbs into it, his arms and his legs, and she tried to force his head in, but thankfully it didn't fit into the bucket. So that's a key element to what happened the next day. David looked terrible at the time anyway, but that particular Friday, March 5th, 1973, when he got to school, the teacher sent him to the nurse's office. And when he walked in, the nurse ran out of the room crying. She came back in with the principal and together they called the police. Now, the nurse had been doing like a daily scan of him. Like he, it was routine. He would go to the nurse. She would look over his body. She would take note of his injuries and he would get sent back to class. Like just. Oh, so they, they were like catching on and like recording stuff. Yeah, they, they like, shift. but there weren't penal codes to protect children back then. So these educators speaking up wasn't guaranteed to save him. The last person who did lost their job. So they're um, just like gathering evidence basically. So they right. be like, yeah. But then on this day when he came in, the nurse was like, we need to call right now because this is not going to end well. Th so they call the cops. This officer comes and immediately took him into custody. David was 12 years old. He weighed 68 pounds. He was covered in filth and had a yellowy waxy texture to his skin because he never bathed. There's zero hygiene. The skin on his limbs was gray and peeling away from the ammonium chloride mm. bath he'd received the night before. So he'd met up with somebody at the school who had rescued him years later, and they were talking about that day, and David didn't remember this whole thing that happened. This was after he wrote his book and everything. And the person was like, David, you didn't have any skin on your body because of what she had done. At the time, authorities called it the third worst child abuse case in the state of California's history. The first two actually had died after being rescued, so David Pelzer considers himself extremely fortunate. When David was rescued, he found out later through seeing one of his brothers that his mom had told the other boys quote the boy got arrested for burning down the school which doesn't even make any sense these kids went to the same school the following week the child abuse laws were so fucked and non-existent in the 70s that neither one of david's parents faced any charges after they lost custody of their son his mother needed serious help and David was leaving four brothers with her. Years later, David saw his brother Richard in his old schoolyard and saw the signs he knew too well. Richard had eventually been chosen as Catherine's new target. Richard would go on to write his own book about his experience called A Brother's Journey, Surviving a Childhood of Abuse. In 1974, a year after David was rescued, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act was passed in California and the awareness of child abuse as a crime grew exponentially. David spent his teen years back 
bouncing around foster families. When David was 13 and living in foster care, he would ride the bus to areas that he knew his dad hung out at and would go from bar to bar looking for him. And sometimes he would find him passed Mm. out. His dad lost his job as a firefighter and eventually became homeless. Mm. David realized that through all of his adversity, he had become an expert at survival and really started living by, if I could survive that, as in his entire childhood, I can survive fill in the blank, whatever the next thing is. Mm -hmm. So he spent his teen years just like working. He joined the Air Force at 18. He also worked as a firefighter. There's still this thing with his dad that he's always had. He doesn't blame his dad either for what he suffered. His dad was also in a fucked up place. And he says that about his mom too. In 1980, when David was 19, he found out that his dad was hospitalized with advanced throat and neck cancer exacerbated by alcoholism. David went to be with him in the hospital, and although his father could no longer speak, he was able to give David his firefighter's badge, uh, which David then took and has carried with him through meeting presidents and speaking engagements and when he was piloting fighter jets and shit like he took that shit with him everywhere not even 10 years later i think david was like 27 he met with his mother to interview her about his upbringing she called him Mm. david at this point and spoke of him as a child as if he were someone else and still referred to him as it he would ask Mm. her questions and he's like what was your end game what were you thinking and she said david i was planning on killing it that summer but the only issue i was having was where to put its body she was just a a very sick woman in december of 1991 david wrote a letter to his mother in it he told her that he loved her but he never wanted to see her again he Mm -hmm. was going to send it after the new year but never got the chance Catherine died on january 2nd 1992 i read two different things i read that she had a heart attack in her sleep and i also read that she had alcohol poisoning so i'm not 100 percent on that after her death david wrote his story in the book a child called it which is the first place that I heard about David Pelzer. Mm. Me too. A really amazing thing about it is that he had the book written in hand, printed, not yet published, but in hand on the 20 year anniversary of his rescue by his teachers. And he met with them and presented the book to them and had maintained a relationship with them ever since listening to him talk about sitting with them and how his story affected them so greatly and just how much it meant to them, how he thrived and survived after that. His book was published in 1995 and became a New York Times bestseller in 97. He's since gone on to write The Lost Boy, A Man Named Dave, The Privilege of Youth, Help Yourself, among other books. Today, Mm -hmm. David is 62 years old and is a motivational speaker. He has a podcast called The Dave Pelzer Show and just celebrated the 50th anniversary of his rescue. Mm. I just want to end on something that he said. It's kind of a mantra of his almost to kind of present his story. He'll say, quote, people call me the poster child of abuse. I'm not about abuse. I stand for resilience, responsibility, and a quiet code of honor. Mm. The Mm. end. I hate this. Goodbye forever. Yeah, my dad met him one time. He did? Yeah, at a... um, I could see your dad just fucking loving him. Yeah, it was at some convention he was at for something. I don't know, but he got a picture and like an autograph book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a very... In in interviews with him, he's an extremely high energy dude. Just like boom, ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. It's cool to listen to him talk about just his like regular life and whatever and being a dad. He's a dad. He's a grandpa. And yeah, he's just like a grandpa who likes to cook and motivate other people he's doing the dang thing mm-hmm. <sighs> well i fucking hate this <laughs> next week we got season five episode 17 mean a schoolgirl's body is found in the trunk of a car benny and stabes investigate allegations of bullying among her classmates rate and review us email us at svupod at gmail.com you guys we have a wish list now uh on amazon <laughs> Is, I, I, is it weird? We don't have to have it. I do love presents. I do love presents. I put I, I put a fucking dishwasher on there. <laughs> <laughs> you put you put like such practical shit on there. You're like, I need a mushroom knife, and I need. Well, that's kind of a fun thing for you. I need a mop and a bucket, and I'm like, I need a cardboard cutout of Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> I uh, I saw that and was like, Yeah, get some Bruce Campbell shit, dude. Like, yeah. <laughs> You know. Okay. Well, we have a wish list that we put together. Maybe you check Sorry it out. Sorry, that's you a don't. douchey. I don't know. If you're like, hey, I want to send these guys something. I don't know what to do though. It's like a registry for a wedding. Come to our wedding. Chop off our registry or don't. 
or don't get us anything and just come and eat all the free food. Who cares? It's an open bar. Yeah, dude. Yeah. P.O. Box 176, DeForest, Wisconsin, 53532. Check out our Instagram at SVU Pod. Get pod merch and more at svupod.com. Join the Facebook group, SVU Pod Elite Squad, and join our chat group called Walk and Talk. It is cute and fun, and I love engaging with everybody in there. Everybody's so supportive in there. It's I know. wild. Of each other. I know. Side messaging each other and stuff. I love it. Yeah. And hashtag little bit loud for indie pods. If you search the hashtag little bit loud, you will find indie pods just like boop, 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 looking to shout their little voice. And if you are a little indie pod, use that hashtag so that the people who are searching it can find you. Yeah. And join the Patreon too. Um, this is going to be like a two hour fucking patreon episode i feel bad for everybody it's gonna be long i leave it yeah. all in the patreon all of it all the sloppy slops is in the patreon <laughs> slop them up i feel like they're so we went off on, i don't even remember i blacked out <laughs> yeah but yeah check out the patreon we also have uh the friendship boats and bonus chasers and we just do all kinds of extra shit for patreon there's discounts on merch there's all kinds of shit mm -hmm. that's it that's it that's it that's it Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye. Mm -hmm. That they do. Benny and Staves are speaking with Adam's second grade teacher. Oh, my God. <laughs> How do I have anyone in my life? <laughs> <laughs> when we're having drinks, call me Mary. <laughs> Dylan? <laughs> Dylan. <laughs> that was the one that I was going to say. Was earlier. it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when we're having drinks, call me Mary. It's 2017. Everybody's eating ass. <laughs> okay. And to our Elite Squad patrons, Sonia W., Marissa M., Elke H., Annie G., Mary D., Andrew, Andrew, Rebecca D., Miranda B., Shelby W., Lex Emily T., Kayla W., Mallory G., Bonita R., Marin, Marin. Vanessa, Amy P., Melanie G., Courtney W., Ursula S., Kate H, Uliana, Kayla J, Catherine M, Kate P, Jessica S, Nicole M, Acacia V, Katerina G, Danielle W, Kelsey D, Jana M, Joshua H, Tammy J, Bear, Bear. Crystal, Lucy M. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? Your voice, like, your voice is like a teenage. It was like, Bear! <laughs> it was so hard. It came like from your throat. It was Bear! Wild. <laughs> yes <laughs> but deep though weird. oh okay yeah like a deep crack it was oh, weird. deep crack that's what we think the high school <laughs> that's, gonna say it. <laughs> that's, oh, that's literally only for the people that are listening to us doing shout outs <laughs> i know <laughs> deep crack <sighs> crystal lucy m trisha s sam d mac 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 attack casey w Abby W, Alexis J, Lauren T, Kaylin B, Camille Z, Nisha G, Meg D, K Allen, Katie M, Eliza W, Crystal B, Jessica P, Zan and J, Nada M, Sin, Christina D, Madison H, Emily. When we drink, don't call me Mary, call me Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Victoria B, uh, Scout G, Melissa M, Desiree D, Drew B, Quentin S, Amberly C, Louise M, Sapphire. I tried to do a little southern one. Oh. Sapphire, go get me a mint julep. Sapphire. Down to foggy London. <laughs> <laughs> go uh. get me a mint julep while I sit on the front porch waiting for your Colonel Angus to come home from the war. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Sketch? Yeah. Right. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Okay. okay um. Monica K, Katie S, Trish S, Angela D, Brenda T, Andrea M, Natasha S, Tashi. Andrea H, Miranda B, Al H, and Nikki R. Where's the Louise? After Amberly. I said Amberly and Louise to oh. not have to deal with your shit. <laughs> 
I wonder if if Emily O hears uh, any of the things that we say in the shout outs. She does. She sent us a message oh, once about it. Yeah. Oh. She was like, oh my God. Or I think she, oh, she, oh, Emily, oh, she buried <laughs> something on Instagram and tagged us. It was us doing the shout outs. And I don't remember which one it was, but I was like, oh, blah, you know, whatever. Uh, oh, something. And she was like, this alone was worth being a patron or whatever oh i didn't i don't think i i don't think i saw that in time 